Hello and welcome to New People, New Ways, a podcast in partnership with Fresh Expressions Florida and Fresh Expressions United Methodist that explores new ways of being church through the stories and insights of scholars and practitioners alike. I'm Piper Ramsey Sumner, layperson and cultivator of Fresh Expressions for the Florida Conference. And I'm Michael Adam Beck. I'm the director of Fresh Expressions Florida and Fresh Expressions UM. And today we're joined by our friend Danielle Buwan Kim. Some of her friends call her Boo, which I like. Uh, Danielle was born in South Korea and moved to the United States during her middle school years. She went on to study biology at the University of Texas at Dallas and subsequently became a high school biology teacher serving in various school districts that included gifted and talented students, as well as at-risk alternative school students. I probably would have been in those, one of your classes, Danielle. <laughs> while, while teaching, Danielle pursued her studies at Perkins School of Theology, Perkins in the house, y'all, where she graduated with a Master of Divinity degree. And she's now an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church with a deep commitment to nurturing faith communities that actively contribute to the betterment of the world. And following her service as the Associate Minister of Adult Discipleship at Custer Road United Methodist Church in Plano, she's currently appointed the Associate Director of Research and Development at the North Texas Annual Conference. I have so many questions. Danielle is married to David and they share the joy of raising two amazing dogs, Methuselah, or Thusi for short, and Nebuchadnezzar, Nezi for short. Uh, Thusi is a brave Dotson, fearlessly navigates life despite being blind, while Nezi is a one-eyed poodle and possesses a heart full of boundless love. Mm. Amen. Love my that. two pugs, my two pugs want to meet Mez Methuselah and Nebuchadnezzar for sure. <laughs> they would love that. <laughs> Fast friends, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome, Danielle. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So glad you're here. So our first question, who is Danielle Buon Kim? Yeah, well, I would say I am a learner. Um, I am my two pups human, Methuselah and Nebuchadnezzar. Michael, you did a good job of, of pronouncing their names. Um, I am a lover of God. Hmm. Love that. Yeah, I like that. I'm, I'm, I work on the biblical languages a little bit. So it's like my one little thing that I can actually do right in the world. But um, so you got to tell us about Ka'al community. Uh, what is the who, the why, and the how the community? Uh, tell us all about yeah, it. Yeah. So um, Ka'al community, we are um, Asian American Pacific Islanders and friends in solidarity. So you do not have to identify as AAPIs to be part of our um, community. And um, our uh, purpose mission statement is that we uh, exist to enjoy really good Asian food, expose and heal from AAPI um, invisibility and reclaim our Christian faith. And so a lot of people ask me what what call means. Um, and so call comes from this um, Filipino wisdom called ka, K-A, um, and it it is a prefix of Tagalog. Um, it is a uh, prefix um, equivalent to English, like coworker or colleague, like it means together. Uh, so uh, in Bai Bai In, which is uh, the ancient written language, um, it, it, it is spelled with two breaths being connected with one line. And so um, I always like to say that uh, somebody like me, who is a Korean American um, um, woman embracing this Filipino wisdom, um, in solidarity with fellow Asian American Pacific Islanders. That's um, our identity. Uh, we're standing together and we're breathing together um, over really good Asian food and doing church. That's us. So wait, Piper and I could show up. And oh yeah, show up. <laughs> totally. Yes. And, and we gotta fly over. Yeah, but you have to like Asian food. Milton um, <laughs> is charged. Um, oh, definitely. Hey. Next time I'm home visiting my family for the holidays I can swing by since we're not we wouldn't be too far away not at all maybe like the, not even 30 minutes yes yeah swing by yeah yeah you two need to connect <laughs> so 
just i haven't been stalking you or anything but i have been like looking at all the pictures and stuff and just checking out the call community it seems like younger folks and um just can you tell us like if someone was to show up at the experience what what would they taste feel experience what would the conversations be like like take us inside the yeah so um we happen to have a lot of uh 20s, young adults, um, 20-somethings, Asian American Pacific Islanders, but we have somebody like me who's not in 20s. <laughs> and uh, um, so we're a very diverse group of people um, in any given gathering. We have about um, three to six heritage uh, represented. And so when you come to our worship service, um, we literally follow our, you know, like a mission statement. Uh, we first enjoy really good Asian food. So we eat and um, and then we go into expose, which is um, uh, time for us to talk about our uh, lived experiences. We do storytellings um, as opposed to preaching. And heal is when we practice um, spiritual practices together, whether it is um, small group discussions or um, prayer, breath prayers. Um, and finally, reclaim Christian faith. Um, I We um, celebrate the communion um, together every time we get together. Um, and I like to say that in current, ancient Korean translation of the Bible, Jesus uh, take the bread. There was no bread uh, in Korea. So they would say there, uh, Jesus broke rice cake. And so mm-hmm. we sometimes celebrate uh, the communion with the rice cake and all that good stuff. And so, and reclaiming our um, heritage um, in Christian faith. Um, and so um, right now we kind of sh- uh, shifted a little bit because we have some families who have kids. And so uh, we actually um, do expose, heal and uh, reclaim first and then we eat. Um, and we're still figuring out we're very nomadic. Um, we're, you know, work in progress and that is absolutely OK. So, yep. I so love that. Um, yeah, if you didn't know this, at Burritos and Bibles, we use a tortilla because that's what's like organic to the space as the body of Love Christ. It. And I'm just I'm just remembering that you and I actually met at a, a, a table over food. And we were at that conference. I think we were both like speaking and doing workshop stuff. And I had heard of you. And then I find myself sitting at the table with you um, around food. So. Yes, food brings us together for sure. Yes, it does. Yes. That's great. I have one one more um, like logistical question because it's just interesting. So, do you meet in somebody's home, and then also do you do you order food from a local restaurant, or do you have some you have some folks that like to cook? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, we first met in a coffee shop, and we did catering and all that, and then we moved to a home, um, and when we were at home, like it was actually my home and we were just gathering around dinner table and cooking and, you know, doing prep together. So that was more easier because living room and kitchen was it's just right there. And so it's just easier for people to cook and stuff like that. Right now we are um, at a local church, at local United Methodist Church um, in Carrollton. Um, and so uh, we're not um, as sort of, of like, it's, it's not, easy as easy as when we're meeting at home uh, cooking food so right now we've been kind of for this season where we've been ordering in but um we would be happy to um, explore like i mean we're just uh, having having a conversation about how much we love cooking and we'd love to sort of try that in the church premise however it looks like we'll see mm-hmm. you know so yep but all of the above yep yeah <laughs> love that i love that um the nomadic nature, like I know, Michael, you've had burritos and Bibles in multiple places. And like, that's what's cool with fresh expressions. You don't need to have this building that you're kind of stuck in all the time. You can evolve and change depending on the needs and the whatever you kind of have around you that you can fit and make it work. That's great. Absolutely. Yeah. I wonder if we could talk more about why food is such an important aspect. So it's an important part of call community, but also uh, I've learned that it's also really important for a lot of immigrants and a lot of people of color in America. Food is something that is important culturally and to people's identities. And so I would love for you to talk maybe more about why you 
think that that is, if I'm right or not. And then also, um, how have you found that food and spirituality mm -hmm. intersect with each other? Yeah. And so, um, so I just went on uh, my first ever international trip <laughs> just a few mm -hmm. months back. And um, I've noticed that the easiest way for me to participate in um, their culture was through food because I've got to eat. Um, other things like, you know, speaking in um, different languages or even participating in rituals may uh, take, you know, there's a little bit of a barrier, but then when it comes to food, you're just kind of like diving into it and you get to know the culture so well, um, you know, literally like immersively. And so um, I think a lot of us, especially 1.5 and second generation immigrant, um, children of immigrants, um, we uh, sometimes lose touch with our home heritage, home country heritage. And so, uh, but what we're so used to and what we're fed, what we grew up with was food. The um, Like if you're a Korean immigrant, Korean food. And so um, that's sort of a way for many of us to uh, claim our heritage, claim our culture um, in the midst of also living as um, American in this context. And so um, I think food can be a way for uh, folks to claim and even reclaim their their culture and who they are and um your second part of your question about like the spirituality and how that's related to the food uh, or the table um, i think about how jesus um on that night jesus was on the table with sharing food breaking bread um and i think about those stories when jesus fed five thousand um Food was something that was very, uh, um, Jesus used a table to be subversive. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, the Roman Empire, the, the Roman Emperor didn't know anything about hungry Jews, the minority people in the Roman Empire. But Jesus says, no, 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 we want to feed. We want to make sure that they are um, taken care of. And so he feeds 5,000 that the Roman Emperor cannot. Um, even the, the table of Jesus, um, it was subversive in that, you know, we had um, Judas who was um, ready to betray, but yet even Judas gets a piece of bread with Jesus um, and that unconditional love. And um, even beyond just biblical tradition, um, you know, I think about, you know, how we eat, what we eat, and who we eat with is all of that. All of those are um, equity issue, what you get to eat, who you get to eat with, how you eat them. Um, and so uh, food definitely is something that is absolutely incarnational and part of our um, faith expression from the biblical standpoint, all the way to just practical everyday uh, lived experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I love also, you know, along those lines, um, just the subversive nature of Jesus, like dinner parties was also the inclusive nature and um, how that kind of, you know, um, got the religious leaders of the day, got him in a little bit of trouble here and there. Like, you know, his bad table manners, he's not doing the ritual cleansings and he's um, hanging out with people that were considered, you know, impure or whatnot. Um, do you ever get any kind of pushback or um, do people, you know, get critical of what you're doing or say that's not church or? Yeah, uh, surprisingly about rice cake, <laughs> doing the communion with rice cake. So a little bit of that. Um, and uh, we also have those who identify as um, non-Christians. They don't, uh, they don't identify themselves as a Christian um, and a part of our community. And so um, there is a little bit of uncomfortableness or pushback from really not from our community members, but from outside, you know, in. Mm -hmm. well, what is it? You know, what are you going to, what are you going to do with, with them? <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and, and, you know, I really, lean on uh, Michael Ginger, um, who is also a fellow Texan uh, here in Texas. Um, and he is um, actually at Galveston Central Church doing amazing work. And he talks about belonging first 
and then let's talk about what we believe. And mm -hmm. I think in our community, that's what we get to do is that you get to belong first. It doesn't matter who you are. You get to or not get to take the communion. Uh, you get to be with us or not, you know, get or you can just eat and leave and that's totally okay. And we're still we still get to be community together and let's belong first and then let's work out and um, yeah, let's work out what we believe and go from there. Mm -hmm. mm, I, yeah. love that. I think the this um, the way that you instead of a sermon, you do conversations. That's a part of that as well, because a non-Christian can join in a conversation about God, even if they don't believe in anything, you know, even if there might be some critiques and things along the way, that can be helpful for, for building up everybody in the room, actually. And um, I think that's something with our, people are much more open to kind of hear what you have to say when they know that you're also willing to hear what they have to say and it not mm -hmm. just be a one-sided conversation. And so they're at the table with other people is the place I would think would be the best to do it eating good food that makes you feel warm and cozy with other people who get it and why you like that kind of food and you right. can enjoy it together. And then you can have your, have some fun discussions about faith, you know, on Absolutely. that kind of even playing field. Yeah. A hundred percent. In fact, um, you, you said um, conversation, we actually uh, call it storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. And so storytelling is a very important, incredibly important part of our community. Um, and I always tell our, our folks that um, since when the work of pro proclamation on the shoulders of preachers only or ordained pastors only, um, the work of proclamation is the work of the church, work of the community. And uh, we do that by um, storytelling, like you said, you know, um, storytelling sort of, um, what is it called, flattens the power dynamics. And mm -hmm. uh, yes, we have had folks who don't identify as Christians come and share their stories with us. Um, and so, and, and that it somehow enriches our faith um, mm -hmm. and, and which is such a mystery, but um, yeah. So storytelling is a very important part of um, our proclamation as well as conversation. I'm so glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. So this is really, really interesting. I just find it um, just a really cool trend that, you basically this is something you've been doing for a while and and had you had any kind of familiarity with the fresh expressions movement or was this something you kind of started and then heard about that movement later or yeah so i actually just wanted to plant a church and then i found out that i'm a fresh expression which hey i, I love it <laughs> i'll take it <laughs> cool. yeah yep yeah, yeah. So see, that's one of the really cool things. And it helps me know that it's a movement of the Holy Spirit. And it's not just something that some people came up with. Because as you're articulating, like, um, belonging, and maybe never believing kind of building community, uh, storytelling, and so we do Jesus stories, or we just do, and, and everybody gets to speak into that conversation, everybody gets to tell their story. There's like these universal things that I feel a lot of people I want to almost say there's like a, a, a praxis kind of forming around this um, mm -hmm. where where the people that are doing this like for their day daily living, you know, um, are, are figuring out as we go along. But then there's this whole movement and these uh, ideas and kind of tools that that can help us. And it's very similar with you. I, I had not really heard of Fresh Expressions until someone came and said, hey, do you know what you're doing is that? So, yeah, I find yeah. that really cool. 100%. Yeah, I got a question for you. So uh, we talk a lot about compassion around here and compassion centered communities and all that. So if you were to divine compassion in your own words, um, what would you say? Yeah, um, I would say that compassion is to affirm one's sacred value uh, apart from their labels. You know, um, no matter their race or gender identities or criminal backgrounds or um, whatever it is, that compassion means I get to affirm the sacred value that you hold as a fellow human being. That's beautiful. Thank you. Of course.
I wonder if you could talk a little more about um, this question. I was thinking because I mentioned earlier, I grew up in Texas, like Oklahoma and then Texas. So right where, where you are and where your community is. Um, and it's the Dallas Fort Worth area, which is very much the Bible Belt. I call it the shiny belt buckle of the vinyl Bible belt right there in Texas because <laughs> we love belt buckles in Texas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But so the call is this commute, this micro church that's happening right there that I would say being the Bible belt, um, it has like Christianity and finding churches and church going people is not as rare as in other parts of the country. Um, and yet you're creating this new community that is bringing in new people. And so I wonder if you could talk about why do you think communities like call? Cause it's not, yours is very unique, but there's a lot that do similar things. Why do you think those kinds of communities and fresh expressions, um, why do they matter in places like the DFW area in these Bible belt kind of locations? Yeah. Um, so I think first of all, fresh expressions, something about it. Um, and, and I'm sort of, um, I, I've been thinking about your comment on um, flattening the power dynamics or flat, like, um, you know, um, it's equal ground. Something mm -hmm. about it just dismantles this, you know, like church, and, you know, um, we have a lot of folks who have been, um, who, who, who were raised in, in the church and um, they're saying no more. So uh, we call them, I think, duns, right? We got a lot of nuns and duns. And um, in fact, um, the DFW area as uh, church saturated as it is, um, it has so much diversity. We have so many heritages and um, immigrants from different places uh, in this community. And we are in need of new uh, expressions of our faith um, to be to be out and about in the field and um, I will and it, it doesn't matter if it's Bible belt or not all of us are commissioned to find and discover God's image in new ways and live that out in fresh ways in new expressions um, and so uh, I think yeah I, I would I was sort of those are sort of my answers to your mm -hmm. question why would it why would it need why would a, a community like call community need be needed in the dfw area yeah mm -hmm. yeah so I, I gotta follow up on that and okay. I'd, like, I'd like to hear more about like your the research aspect of your work um is mm -hmm. really intriguing but i find florida similar a bit north florida to texas kind of culture bible belt ish kind of things happening and i find you know, one of the greatest challenges in, in, in my daily practice is Christians who have some pretty toxic, fundamental theology who show up to these groups sometimes and then they just interject that. Yeah, yeah. It's not the people <laughs> we're trying to reach that have no connection with the church or have been deeply traumatized by the church. Right. That feels like it's just like we're getting on a train, the Holy Spirit's driving and we're, we're just following along with God. Yeah. But the, the, the biggest challenges I find are the deeply problematic, um, inherited aspects of the Bible belt. I love it. I, that, just <laughs> I just realized that my identity repels them. <laughs> Like um, the, who wants to come to a like you know a, a church led by like Asian American you know clergy woman led church you know what I mean like those guys don't mm -hmm. those folks don't want to come to my church. <laughs> so, yeah. But bless you, brother Michael. I, it sounds like you're having a trouble there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, it, it's good. It's good, and yeah. I think like what you said about how we are kind of blowing up the clergy caste system and the hierarchical, you know come listen to the monologue of the professional and we're like facilitating dialogues and his priesthood of all believers and every person has value and worth and as a priest in a sense um creating those kind of communities really does push against um what people have conceived to be church and um all of that but yeah mm -hmm. so research what what does that part of your job look like your your ministry yeah and so um research when we say research uh we are literally gathering data um what are we learning 
What are we learning out there that that you're doing and what can we learn from it? And then let's gather those learnings and let's sort of wrestle with it. And so um, I've been in this role for only about a year, um, still learning. And in fact, um, uh, I'm actually getting a new appointment, Michael, <laughs> to a local church, which I'm absolutely excited. So I'll be sort of, um, it would be a fast turnaround for me to be here. And then I'm going back to local church. Uh, and as you know, the conference is going through unification and all that. And so, um, but so, so, um, we are in the process of, of learning what it means to research, learning what it means to gather both quantitative and qualitative learnings and um, help all of us to discern what that means for our own, our own context. So I wonder if that's helpful to you. It is helpful. And I, I feel like I'm, I'm my, I have a little behind the scenes motivation in my question is we just don't have good research in the fresh expressions movement in the United States. Hmm. So in the United Kingdom, where the movement kind of, you know, sprung out of there, although um, base ecclesial communities in Latin and Central America look really similar to Fresh Expression, but they have research, like they have people that that's their job to like research these things. And they have really good data around who's in the Fresh Expressions and are they nuns, duns, and the makeup of all that. And yeah. so, yeah, I don't think... I know we're all United Methodists on this call. Not all of our listeners are, but um, we got to get ahead of that. We got to, we got to, yeah, we have to. Somebody. Be- Amen. Yes. Come on. Yes. <laughs> to keep that research going, especially I bet in the North Texas, because the DFW area is growing all the time. So much, so much happening. Absolutely. And the landscape's always kind of changing every time I come back and visit. So I'm sure there's a lot. A lot, lot of things to learn from all of that. Um, I, be, before you move on, let me, if I oh, were, yeah. if I may, if I may um, stay here just a little bit, I think the hardest part about researching is not drawing conclusion of what we have like learned from these pieces of data, but it's actually the process of gathering data. That mm-hmm. is the hardest part. Yes. And so um, I am going to uh, take up uh, this moment to beseech beseech all of us to do something about, you know, like data gathering. Is there any centralized way of da- gathering data so that, you know, um, we're not recreating wheels or, you know, mm-hmm. have even regionalized way of, you know, um, cataloging all these fresh, fresh expressions. And also for us to do that, we've got to celebrate what we consider it to be failure, um, mm-hmm. you know, and create the culture that, you um, you know, never, you know, you may try and you may fail, but you never fail to try. Um, mm-hmm. And celebrating those, what we consider it to be fall- failures, because those are the ones that we learn the most. Uh, mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there for somebody who's research and development in ministry out there to, you know, to be helpful. So, yeah, so everybody I, I, get together. Yeah, <laughs> I have to have a moment of public uh, repentance and confession here about the nature of trying to collect the data, right? Um, I am so passionate about, like, we need to do this because, you know, it's going to really help our work. But myself, um, in a church that has no staff and we're all lay driven, so, and even I myself am a quarter time appointed clergy person, um, I actually forgot to report our fresh expressions. So we have like nine of them. And it's just, I, I think a lot of people who do this are not necessarily thinking about doing reports or, or so in Florida, one of the cool things and Piper really spearheaded this actually was we have started to collect data, at least to know in our charge conference paperwork, people's fresh expressions um, and how many people are meeting in them. And so we're starting to get a sense of that so we can get, get some, you know, at least provisional data around that stuff. Um, but pioneers, adventurers, we call them in FXUM movement, uh, they're notorious for not taking time to fill out reports and check boxes and all that. I think it's mm-hmm. the effectual reasoning logic set that they use rather than the causal logic set. And like, right. But I don't know how we could make it more friendly or that it's not this burdensome report we had to fill out. There's got to be a way 
to make it more uh, accessible so that people right. get excited about it, you know? I, I noticed and learned um, through this role that people are so up for having a 20 minute phone call with you anytime, yeah. any day. But once you put that five minute worth of form in front of their, you know, uh, in mm -hmm. front of them, they're, they're like, oh, I ain't doing this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so yeah. I think um, it is, um, I think having somebody like Piper or even this role that I'm, um, you know, in right now um, to be able to make those organic um, learning relationships, learning communities, you know, those um, the culture of wanting to come together and share what we're doing, kind of like what we did um, in the past uh, conference, UMFX uh, conference. Uh, it was a learning community and goodness, the Holy Spirit was there. There were a lot of uh, movers and shakers um, in that room reporting what they were doing. And those are the pieces of data, data that we can um, gather and um, share. And so, um, yeah, so kudos to, to all, all of you for being able to do that. I think that's the first way of us doing the uh, research and development. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So, okay, I was thinking to bring it back around to, um, to the call community and Michael, you have the word for it. I can't remember, but in, when you talk about in your book, Doing Justice Together, written with um, with uh, with Stephanie, but you write about how you tried to bring in two communities, a black church and a white church, and you tried to have church together on Sunday, and it didn't work well because there's a there's like a soul language to certain certain like uh, worship settings that that touch people in certain ways and not, not in other spaces, not, and it doesn't. And so, um, because I'm thinking with call community, it's so, it's a very specific thing. It's speaking to a specific experience, although others are un invited in as allies, but it's centered on something. And that's something that I also have seen people push back with fresh expressions. Uh, for example, a group that I have, we meet in breweries. And so we're meeting in places where there's going to be alcohol and not everybody, that's not a safe place or a good place or an inviting place for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so that's something about the nature. And I'm wondering if the future of the church might look more and more like this, where we'll have communities that are more, more specific, but then what could that look like to prevent us from creating groups that are so specific that they create insiders and outsiders? Mm -hmm. Um number one. And then, but then I think on the opposite side is trying to create a, a church for, for all people in that kind of sense of like, we need to be like Paul's issue of um, being all things for all people. There's like, there's a balance somewhere within that. So maybe I would like to hear from both of you guys about that idea. Yeah. Do I go first? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I, I've wrestled with this uh, question, Piper. I'm so glad you're asking this because um, we have multi-ethnic churches um, that are sort of like celebrating these different languages, different worship songs that are sung in uh, different languages. And, you know, like, oh, yeah, look, 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 look at us. Like we're very diverse and we reflect the kingdom of God or we look, reflect the neighborhood. And I, I love it. I, I think um, there's something so powerful about being able to bring um people from very different background to come and worship together, despite the language differences, despite the cultural differences. And in fact, call community, as I mentioned earlier, is a multicultural community. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so when we think about Asian American Pacific, we think about just like one umbrella, but it's actually uh, we're a very diverse umbrella. <laughs> that makes sense. Like there's, there's so much going on under that umbrella, if that makes sense. So um, so leading this, um, oh, well, yeah. And so one way, one way of saying it is that it's important for us to definitely pursue looking like our neighborhood and it's hard work and absolutely needed. And um, for us to do that, I think what's important is that we know who we are. We can only appreciate diversity uh, once we understand who we are, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, and, and this is just Danielle speaking again, like I reserve my right to be wrong. <laughs> and like, I reserve my right to in this like uh, develop a stage of development. Um, I have noticed and I might be wrong. Um, 
I have noticed that those multicultural um, congregations tend to be very first generation immigrant centric. Um, and so their children might attend those churches, but, uh, and I might be wrong, it might be my ignorance and please somebody email me or, you know, call me up or whatever, and I'd be happy to learn. Um, but that's what I've noticed. Whereas um, communities like call community, we are trying to reclaim what's been lost and what's been sort of ripped away from us. Um, and so that we know who we are and we know our experiences. We know how to read scripture with our own lived experiences that are not being really preached or understood elsewhere so that we can go and be um, uniquely ourselves and also inclusive of others and be the church together. So um, it's, it, I, I want to say this right. It's like, color, we don't want to fall into like color blindedness um, in a sense. And, and no one is doing that. I, and I'm not, you know, calling that out. Uh, but but just to make a point that um, um, for us to not be color blinded, we, we've got to, uh, we've got to develop this self-awareness of who we are. And, and, and that propels us to pursue diversity even further. Yeah, yeah. So and I can piggyback on this. Um, a lot of things were coming out against fresh expressions initially in the beginning stages, like whole books were written about it, like uh, against uh, for the parish, you know, against fresh expression. And a lot of the critique was um, just institutionalism, really, and power brokers that were threatened by it. And Danielle, like you just so wonderfully pointed out, it was primarily white euro tribal power holding culture that was offering this critique who didn't necessarily understand the value of um oppressed and, and invisible communities gathering together and working on their belovedness and identity so they just totally missed that but the one thing about their critique that i had to reckon with and and um, really had to think about how to respond to this was the homogeneous unit principle which comes from Donald McGavran, you know, Bridges of God, that missiologist. Um, and what actually, when I studied his life and how he practiced and his core idea is like, people don't become Christian in an individualistic culture where it's all about you and rugged individualism and all, all those value sets, right? Then collectivistic cultures who think, you know, Ubuntu, they think communal formation, that we're not, we're not individuals, we're a bundle of relationships and all this. So his argument was really astute and his practice was good that people become Christian in groups as communities. You shouldn't extract people from their social web back to the Christian compound, Christianize them. And then, but then of course, white you mega church people took on this side of the pond, took the homogeneous unit principle and like created Saddleback Sam and let, let, let's use it to make, congregations that are, where everybody looks the same and votes the same and believes it. So we took this, you know, bastardized version of it. But Fresh Expression gets it back to, I think, the core of what McGavern was trying to say before it got hijacked. Mm -hmm. uh, and that there is this value in people, especially oppressed, marginalized people getting together, which is what the early church was and did right uh, in their in their earliest, you know, life together. And um, that something powerful happens in that. But then how do we, over time, like connect it all up? And the Wildwood example is really specific because it's racism and it's segregation and it's white and black, you know, and, and a historically terrible clash. Uh oh, so I don't know what happened to Piper. Um, so in that situation, um, it trying to honor and preserve those cultures, but at the same time, um, not let it stay there. We did a dinner church together called Taste of Grace. Um, so that way everybody came together and we were all in like a common unity around food and eating together and that such. So we kind of didn't mess with worship and 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 kind of, because um, it, it could be really easy. The other thing, and I could be wrong too, and I also reserve the right to be wrong here as well. <laughs> um, but a lot of the multicultural churches that get kind of touted and celebrate they really still operate under the principle of white supremacy and there's <laughs> there's diversity on the stage right and that's the value but there's not diversity in the boardroom uh there's not equal power in decision making usually in those churches 
So I do wonder if Fresh Expression gives us a way to bring an ecosystem of church together. So there is a unity in our common life, but it also can be really distinct and, and contextual. Um, and then, you know, cross pollinating those relationships in, in different ways could be really valuable. So a hundred percent, I can't agree more. And, um, you know, it's not going to be like either or, but both. And, and uh, Michael, I love um, your, um, you know, when you're talking about talking about mixed ecology, um, it is going to be both. And it is going to take every thing, every one of us, it'll take every one of us to be all things to all, all people. And so um, um, I think I, I, it doesn't really trouble me that because number one, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, for cost specifically, uh, it is multicultural. <laughs> we have a lot of languages, a lot of cultures being um, expressed in our um, you know, community, even though from outsider, it's just Asian gathering. It is not just Asian gathering. There's so much diversity in age, experiences, gender identities, and et cetera. Um, and secondly, um, I think I, I do want to make a point that that's why I love being a Methodist that mm -hmm. we get to be connectional with one another, that my community members know that, um, you know, whether they're method that they identify themselves as Methodist or not, we belong to a bigger community. Um, and we're funded by a bigger community. Uh, we're loved by a bigger community. Um, and in fact, we uh, partnering with a nonprofit organization um, that does, um, it's called Together We Dine by Project Unity. Um, they are basically over dinner, they're having racial reconciliation conversations. It's not faith um, based sort of a, um, activity. It is just for communities to come together and have these conversations. And uh, we get to see that we're part of bigger things. I think that's the important part is that we're not just kind of like caving in to our own little thing, but that we constantly put ourselves out there offering ourselves offering our culture and heritage and our reflections for the bigger body to enjoy and um, exist together um, going to annual conferences and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so mm -hmm. yes all of the above <laughs> sounds like a great methodist all of the above <laughs> yes. that's right, that's right. yeah we were just um we're recording this like the week after general conference were you right. able to go and visit i know michael you were there at the beginning and where did you check out any of that danielle uh i did check out but i didn't get to go yes oh yeah yeah because that's such a great ex exact example of that like okay. methodists from all around the world together you know right mm -hmm. right yeah that's great and even beyond that right not just methodism but um i my my prayer and my hope is that um, uh, call community as a fresh expression and fresh expression groups um, in our connection um, deeply understands uh, that they are uh, in, you know, Methodism is part of this bigger thing that God is doing, you know, mm -hmm. and that we get to be this essential great part of it, but we're part of it. We're not it. <laughs> we're mm -hmm. part of and that we get to be part of God's grace at work in bigger picture. Um, so that is the beauty of uh, fresh expression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. And because it's also, it kind of naturally resists the, you know, grow, grow no matter what kind of perspective that is a business thing and a capitalism thing that has seeped into our churches. And so our churches, it's all about the numbers. How many people do we have? How many members, you know? Um, but I can't imagine you know, uh, you know, 200 people showing up at your house and being like, all right, it's time to eat, you know, <laughs> like right. that would be impossible for call community. That might not be something that you ever really, ever really want to happen. I know that's true for my, my group. I like, uh, I don't know. I can't imagine us being bigger than we are because they're n you're not able to connect on that deep level, but I love the idea of other communities that look like mine popping up in other places and they growing the way that they, that they grow in those little micro churches as um as call you name it those micro churches can become the big the ecosystem that's all together one yeah mm -hmm. yeah and, and and just uh not to go super methodist nerd into the, like the the early history of methodism but there was that core commitment to the small and you know understanding god's movement as waves of grace and going out to do the field preaching 
but then small groups of people intimately knowing each other. And, and these were mostly the poor and the oppressed in, in um, the Wesley's day. They were not the uh, upstanding, you know, middle, middle class, enlightenment culture people. They were the people that basically the church had forgot about and left out. Right. That, that's where they started. And, and in those, um, you know, small groups of deep knowing and, and love, they, they developed and, you know, formed a movement through that. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> well, Danielle, we, this is a question that we ask everybody. So I'm going to ask you this one. Mm -hmm. What does the future of the church look like to you? And what is your hope? Yeah. So um, I always, uh, it just excites me to think about the future of the church and what gives me hope. Um, so many, many things. And I actually, if you don't mind, I, I wrote something <laughs> here yeah. because it was so important to me that I, I share this with with you all. Uh, yeah. So I've, I've wrote down like five different things um, and um, so number one is that we are becoming an organization, a movement that is driven by value, not by vision. And I've been thinking about this development of my leadership, uh, what it means to uh, lead with values as opposed to vision. Mm. And so um, that would be, um, and I'll leave it right there. So well, well, no, uh, yeah. <laughs> leave it right there. <laughs> my listeners, uh, unpack it a little bit for like that yeah. distinction. Right. So um, I'm kind of, kind of going back to what, what Piper was mentioning earlier, you know, um, vision driven leadership is and there's nothing wrong with it. I um, value it, but it should it should not, in my opinion, supersede value driven leadership um, because leaders Future leaders will help the members or community members uh, to be able to vision together. But they will be the ones who will help us identify these core values in which will guide us to vision together. So one leader having this grand uh, vision of how things are going to work out and then people following um, that day, I believe, is over. The role of the leader would be um, being able to articulate and um, draw out these core values of the community so that they may be able to vision together for uh, the future. Um, um, yeah, so. Okay, yeah. Okay, scratch the itch. Did I scratch the itch? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And secondly, I think, you know, a totally a big subscriber of you, uh, Michael, uh, mixed ecology. I think there will be churches that will be in the sanctuary as well as churches, churches that are going to be in the mountains and valleys and, you know, public squares and newsletters and with pickets and, you know, you name it in the bars. And um, there will be, you know, when I think about the uh, the way Jesus ministered and when we, the way Jesus was doing the church, you know, um, and I keep going back to that story of uh, feeding the 5,000. What if, what if that was the church? What if those spectators, those hungry people, those um, mm -hmm. accident, you know, um, happy accidentally being there kind of people, you know, all of those are the church, you know, they didn't have to do prayer presence, give service witness, which I love prayer presence, give service witness. I'm not, you know, this is, you know, so hear me out. But what if the church is more than membership? What if it was something that we share together, we belong first and then work out our commitments and beliefs um, later. So, yeah. So, and thirdly, it's really unpopular opinion, but um, I think future of the church will look at sustainability with nuanced um, way, um, in a nuanced way, um, and in meaning that um, I think sustainability, when we talk about sustainability, I wonder if we want to sustain the means as opposed to the goal, that um, we are you know, doing all these things so that we keep doing what we've been doing as opposed to we um, proclaiming the gospel that's absolutely needed um, in our community. And so um, 
yeah, those who will, you know, lose, find their lives will lose them. And those who lose their lives will find them. And what would it mean for us to risk what we think is important so that we may proclaim the good news? So, um, yeah. And I dream of a church that, fourthly, I uh, a dream of a church that is not meeting every Sunday. I dream of a church that meets every other week, and that's about it. But the Sunday mornings, we're out going in a brunch and drinking our mimosas and, you know, all that stuff, you know, and meeting with people who are not in the church. And mm -hmm. that's part of our ministry. That's our lived life in the community together, absolutely embedded and building stronger community Um and um, finally, offering the means of grace more readily and more flexibly that the church will be, um, you know, you don't have to go to the sanctuary to to receive the means of grace, like mm -hmm. sacraments or, you know, um, yeah. And so I hope that was not too cumbersome of my hope for the church. <laughs> no, no, it was brilliant. Um, on, the, on the nuanced aspect of sustainability right would you say that that includes like co-vocational bivocational lay ministry models or what what did you mean when you you know thought about sustainability, sustainability. yeah like a lot of people when they think about that they think about economic sustainability and you know yeah the current way that we think about that right right and and i um want to begin by saying that that is something that i take very seriously and i still am working out a lot of things again i reserve my right to learn and grow and be wrong uh, but um i am thinking about how um yeah sustainability meaning that uh if if push comes to shove Will we be able to abandon? And it's gonna be really unpopular. And so I'm just gonna say it. Like, hopefully you don't hate me. Um, so uh, will we be able to abandon? Not abandon, but um, lay down uh, of our full time salary, or the building, or uh, the weekly Sunday morning worship services, or even music? You know those means, because. Mm -hmm. um, Again, I, I, this is, I, I imagine, a whole another like thing that I probably need to, you know, really, you know, think through and and, and expound upon. But um, there is this um, obsession over sustainability, I think, that holds us back from really wit be the witness in the mission field. Mm -hmm. That um, when we are willing to um, strip all that and just be it's because one of the things that i've learned working with nuns and duns is that the, the gospel of jesus christ is absolutely resonant with people mm. it's absolutely resonant with people we've got a good we've got the good news mm -hmm. and are we willing to sort of ditch the ways in which it hasn't been working for us to go and be effective and um so I, this ministry is my second career and I think about uh, what it means to be a, a vocational pastor that's being salaried um, and what it means for me to be sustainable in, in the future. What does it mean for me to go back to fishing, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and while still trying to be in ministry? Um, and uh, so are we equipping ourselves to think about those creative ways too? So yes, to answer your question, yes, I'm talking about bivocational, co-vocational, all of the above. And really, I think what I'm talking about more is the priesthood of all believers. Are we um, mm -hmm. empowered and equipped so that no matter who you are, clergy, laity, um, that we are freed to do what God has called us to do without thinking about sustainability, because sometimes sustainability might not be the right answer, right way to go about it. When you look at the effectiveness of ministry, unpopular opinion, but mm. <laughs> yeah. So just my, my opinion here, we've asked a lot of people that question, like best-selling authors, professors, bishops, uh, a lot of folks. I think that's the most thoughtful, um wonderful answer to that question that we've ever had on the podcast that's uh, sense. thank you thank you michael yeah yeah thank you danielle this was really great yeah really wonderful well thank you for having me it was such a treat for me yes.
good. I'm glad this was great. Yeah, tell our listeners where can they find you? Where can they follow you? Learn more about you online. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's a callcommunity.org, K A L L uh, community.org. And there you will find some of our events and, you know, posts and things like that. Yep. And so, yeah. Very cool. I'll have that in the show notes so people can can track you down and see what. Wonderful. See, you guys have some good some food photos too, so they can get hungry for some good food mm. as well. I know, well, I know. The next ex uh, fresh expression that I'm thinking about is having like a cooking class. I still haven't figured out like how I'm gonna do all those like different, you know. But um, and you know, stay tuned. <laughs> that's yeah, that's all I'm trying to say. Stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned. <laughs> Love that. That's great. Yes. Thank you again, Danielle, for being here. Thank you for having me. Yes. And to those listening, thanks so much for joining this episode of New People, New Ways. If you enjoyed our conversation with Danielle, please give it a rate, review, and subscribe and share it with your friends. To connect with us and learn more about Fresh Expressions, you can go to freshexpressionsfl.org and find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. See you next time on New People, New Ways.